Isaac Newton was not only a genius for generalizing Kepler's laws through a quantitative force law of attraction between masses and his laws of mechanics, but he also realized the problems of his own formulation. In his correspondence with Richard Bentley in 1692, Newton expressed his unconfirmity with the idea that gravity could act at a distance instantaneously without a medium. That gravity should be innate, inherent and essential to matter, so that one body may act upon another at a distance through a vacuum, without the mediation of anything else, by and through which their action and force may be conveyed from one to another, is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has in philosophical matters a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. The problem with gravitational action at a distance was solved by Einstein's general relativity, in which gravity is propagated through space-time curvature, and it is now proved observationally that gravity travels at the speed of light. But the genius of Einstein also left a hint on the problem of this theory the same way Newton did in his 1914 paper on the relativity problem. He stated that classical mechanics, as well as relativity theory in the narrow sense briefly described above, suffer from fundamental defect, which no one can deny, that is accessible to epistemological arguments. The weaknesses of our physical world pictured to be discussed below were already uncovered with full clarity by Ernst Mach in his deeply penetrating investigations of the foundations of Newtonian mechanics, so that what I will assert in this respect can have no claim to novelty. I will explain the violation of the most elementary postulate of epistemology of which our physics is guilty in yet another way. One would try in vain to explain what one understands by the simple acceleration of a body. One would only succeed in defining relative acceleration of bodies with respect to each other. However, having said that, we base our mechanics on the premise that a force, cause, is necessary for the generation of a body's acceleration, ignoring the fact that we cannot explain what it is that we understand by acceleration exactly because only relative accelerations can be an object of perception. Einstein attempted to build his general theory of relativity without absolute acceleration, acceleration with respect to space-time, through the use of tensors and replace it with the Machian notion of relative acceleration, acceleration with respect to other bodies. But he was unsuccessful in doing so. And general relativity features an absolute notion of acceleration similar to that of Newton's. It is often argued that acceleration is absolute because it can be measured by an accelerometer. But accelerometers always measure acceleration with respect to an inertial frame of calibration. For instance, an accelerometer in freefall would not measure the gravitational acceleration, but only an acceleration happening with respect to freefall which is referred to as proper acceleration. In contrast, coordinate acceleration depends on the chosen reference frame and it cannot be measured by an accelerometer. But how can we determine if the frame of calibration is inertial? The way we identify the frame of calibration as inertial is due to the lack of inertial forces. For instance, for two bodies in deep space, one accelerating with respect to the other one, only one of them always experiences inertial forces, while the other one doesn't. When one switches to the accelerating frame of the body which experiences inertia, the inertial forces do not switch to the other one. Through these inertial forces, Newton argued that acceleration was absolute with respect to absolute space. But Ernst Mach argued that these inertial forces appear due to accelerated motion with respect to the rest of the universe, not with respect to an absolute and unobservable space or space-time absent of physical properties. This would be equivalent to redefining inertial frames as those not accelerating with respect to the rest of the universe. We explained Mach's ideas in their implications in our previous video, Mach's principle explained. According to Mach, in an empty universe with no background of stars and galaxies, inertial forces would not exist and acceleration would be truly relative. But this is not the case in the Newtonian and Einsteinian framework when one considers an empty universe. Even without any mass, the Newtonian and Einsteinian theories feature absolute accelerations and the same mechanism for inertial forces, because both frameworks do not rely on the distribution of the rest of the masses of the universe to explain local dynamics or inertia. 
Following Mach, the solution of the twin paradox is simple. The observer experiencing time dilation is the one who accelerates with respect to the rest of the masses of the universe. And special relativity somehow substitutes the frame of the rest of the universe with the space-time background of the Minkowski metric. Dialects channel rejects the Machian solution to the twin paradox and acceleration relative to the rest of the masses of the universe. He does so by claiming that first, Mach's principle implies non-locality and second, that the paradox is not resolved in empty space. There is yet still one intuitive definition of absolute motion left to us. This is the idea that absolute acceleration, i.e. non-inertial motion, can be defined as acceleration with respect to the rest of the universe. While on the surface this definition is highly appealing, it suffers from a crucial defect. It's non-local. That is, if acceleration is supposed to be a real effect, then the information that something is accelerating must be transmitted to that something at the moment that the acceleration occurs. But if information can only travel at the speed of light, then this information can't come from a great distance away. In other words, you can only be causally affected by things in your immediate vicinity. So the state of motion of the rest of the universe relative to you at the moment of your acceleration is both irrelevant and impossible to know. Whatever you're accelerating relative to, it must be located within your immediate vicinity. But there's still a problem with this definition, because if we formulate the twin paradox in empty space, then there will be no rest of the universe for the twins to refer to, and thus no way to determine which twins' frame is inertial. So we have to cross that definition off too. We will address the second claim later in this video. But firstly, Mach really did not offer a local or even quantitative explanation for how the rest of the masses of the universe communicate to the accelerated object that he is accelerating with respect to the universe. But if one follows the Machian argument beyond his writings, it is clear that this communication is mediated by gravity, which we know propagates at the speed of light. Dialect is correct when he stated that whatever you are accelerating relative to, it must be located within your immediate vicinity to ensure locality. But there is a way to account for the rest of the masses of the universe locally, and that is through the matter field that these masses create in all space-time casually connected to them. With this field being gravity, it cannot be blocked or screened because, unlike in electromagnetism, there are no negative masses to cancel the effect of the positive mass of the universe. In particular, the models that unify gravitation and inertia following marks, such as Schiamas or Treaders, identify the matter field of the masses of the universe as the potential of these masses, the gravitational potential without the gravitational constant. And they are able to mechanistically explain more than Mach could ever imagine. The origin of inertial forces as an interaction with the rest of the universe, the value of the gravitational constant and the weakness of gravity, and the equivalence principle and the notion of inertial mass. We covered these models in our previous video, History of Modified Inertia, in which the mass and size of the universe appear in their formulation. But all these modified theories of inertia have the same problem. They are non-relativistic and not Lorentz invariant. And now we must ask ourselves again. Why do special and general relativity feature absolute accelerations in absence of a background universe? It is because they are based on the Minkowski metric, which acceleration is defined with respect to analogous to Newton's absolute space. Going back to Mach, absolute acceleration because of motion with respect to the rest of the universe in special relativity as a solution to the twin paradox seems to have a problem. If there was no background universe, which observer would experience time dilation if acceleration is relative? Dialect is not satisfied with this result of not being able to determine which frame is inertial in empty space. But that's only because he expects time dilation to still occur in absence of the rest of the universe. Emulating Mach, no one is competent to say how the paradox would turn out if there was no fixed background of the universe. The obvious solution to this problem is to conclude that time dilation cannot occur if there is no background universe. 
Following Mach. If all motion, including acceleration, is relative when there is no background universe, then all relativistic effects must be purely relative. If there is no asymmetry between both twins, they must have aged the same amount, meaning the paradox dissolves. This would imply that special relativity is not valid in empty space unless one introduces a Minkowskian metric as absolute spacetime, and that somehow relativistic effects have an origin in the rest of the masses of the universe as well. Indeed, this was Einstein's Machian way of thinking in his solution to the twin paradox through the appearance of a uniform gravitational field, whose source was the motion of the rest of the universe, and substituting special relativistic time dilation for the gravitational time dilation. The space twin will instead claim to see a uniform gravitational field arise throughout all space one that accelerates the Earth, his twin, and the rest of the fixed stars towards him. At the same time, he feels a force from his rockets which keeps him from moving along with the rest of the universe. Now, because clocks run faster farther out in gravitational fields, distant objects will appear to age very rapidly from his perspective, and thus, by the time he finishes turning around, he will see that his Earth twin has aged through more elapsed time than himself. He claimed that the source of the gravitational field could be attributed to the motion of the fixed stars. That is, he wrote, Just as an accelerated charge induces a changing electric field, so should an accelerated mass induce a changing gravitational field. In this way, an observer's worldview will remain consistent with being at rest, even if they are accelerating. Uni Krishnan has tried to explain time dilation having a gravitational origin by substituting the square of the speed of light for Skiyama's relationship in the Lorentz factor. Therefore, what we thought in relativity as 1 minus v square by c square, the velocity of light, c square, it is not that, well, it has nothing to do with velocity of light. It has to do with the gravitational potential of the universe. It is 1 minus v square divided by the potential of the universe. Relativity is controlled by cosmic gravity. But this is not Machian, since one would expect the Lorentz factor to reduce to unity if the mass of the universe tends to zero according to Mach. And this does not happen in Unikrishnan's proposal. The way to achieve this is by multiplying Skiyama's relationship with the Lorentz factor so that relativistic effects vanish in empty space a la Mach. Although Dialect's proposal for acceleration being absolute with respect to an ether is tempting, there is one problem with it. It does not provide a quantitative description of the phenomena he wants to explain, because as far as we know, there are no known physical properties of the ether itself, at least regarding the ones related to inertia and gravitation. In contrast, the Machian perspective is quantitative because we have an estimation of the mass and size of the observable universe from direct observations, and we can make predictions with them. But how can this Machian view of inertia and the relativity of acceleration be empirically tested? The way to do this is to focus whether Newtonian and Einsteinian frameworks are in conflict with observations. One of these conflicts is the dark matter effect on galaxy rotation curves. If the problem of dark matter is not solved by physical dark matter, but by a modified theory of gravity or modified inertia, such as Milgram's Mond. We explained Mond in our previous video, does Mond work and modified inertia. Mond is built directly to satisfy the observational patterns and regularities observed in dark matter effects on galaxy rotation curves. And it can be reformulated with the same parameters of the Machian modified theories of inertia explained before. That is, with the mass and size of the observable universe. We were the first ones to show that Mond can be reformulated in terms of Mach's principle without fundamental constants, with the exception of speed of light, in what we called Machian Mond, which we explained in our previous video, Machian Mond paper presentation. Mond requires the introduction of one free parameter, an acceleration scale, which coincides with the gravitational field intensity of the observable mass of the universe. 
Milgram tried to define absolute acceleration as acceleration with respect to the vacuum in his formulation of Mond. So in, in Mond you need to define your acceleration with your absolute acceleration. So what, what is the frame that, that, that will provide this? So I thought maybe it's the vacuum, okay, the quantum vacuum. And that is why he usually relates his acceleration scale constant with the cosmological constant, that is, with the energy density of the vacuum. But under a Machian perspective, Mond must come from a symmetry involving the gravitational field intensity of the observable mass of the universe, or in other words, a symmetry of acceleration. It must come from something similar to where the Lorentz factor comes from in special relativity, from a new boost symmetry generalizing Lorentz invariance. Indeed, Machian Mond resembles a Lorentz-like transformation between two non-inertial reference frames, the local frame of the galaxy and the global frame of the rest of the masses of the universe. If a function depending on velocities such as the Lorentz factor arises from Lorentz invariance in special relativity, where accelerations are absolute for consistency of the theory, one would expect a function depending on accelerations or field intensities such as Machian Mond to arise when relativizing accelerations. Lorentz invariance implies that the speed of light is constant in all inertial frames. And it seems that Marchian Mons implies that the total field intensity at any point in the universe is always greater than to that of the rest of the masses of the universe. Does Marchian Mond come from the relativity of acceleration and inertia? How can Marchian Mond be introduced in relativistic theory? We will explore these ideas in future videos.